Welcome to Fan Counters. My name's Nick, and Elizabeth is still RVing her way around Florida. I know her and her family have gone to Walt Disney World and St. Augustine, to name a couple of those locations. She should be back in a couple weeks, and I'm sure she'll bring along a lot of great stories about her vacation. Uh, I'm kind of anxious to hear some of them. Uh, in the meantime, though, we're going to carry on with what we do here on Fan Counters. You can follow us on social media by looking us up on Twitter and Instagram at Fan Counters Live. We've got a humongous Facebook following, very loyal following, if you go to facebook.com forward slash Fan Counters. You can also email us show ideas, guest ideas, give us comments and feedback on the show. You can do that by emailing us at hello at fancounters.com. We'd love to hear from you. I don't know what it's like in your world where you live, but here in Wisconsin, we have a lot of music concerts that come through the area in the summer because there's really only 90 days of good weather here uh, where it's not cold or I'm exaggerating a little bit, but tonight I got to go see an 80s rock band, very popular. They've been performing for over 31 years, and that band was Tesla. Jeff Keith is the lead singer of the band, and even in his 60s, he was rocking the stage. It was He was so entertaining. Uh, loved seeing Tesla in concert tonight. Uh, this weekend, we've got Country Thunder USA going on, and we are a media partner of Country Thunder USA, so we will be on location talking to the artists performing at the concerts, and we will be featuring them on future episodes uh, coming your way very soon, so stay tuned for that. Uh, today on the show, we've got a very talented actress, Malia Beth Johnson. You would know her from her roles on Parks and Recreation, Cougar Town, Mad Men, an American Horror Story. And although she has an impressive television resume already, she just completed an adventure in live theater during her one-woman show, The Woman is Perfected. We're going to go behind the scenes of her TV and film career. We're also going to learn why she wanted to do this one-woman show in front of live audiences night after night. Now, my first experience with a one-person show was a Showtime or HBO special uh, you can even look it up on YouTube. It was with Stephen Banks. Uh, very entertaining 50-minute performance. Uh, one person on stage the whole entire time. It's amazing how they can carry a show, know every line, and do it night after night. And this is what you're going to see if you got to see The Woman is Perfected. We're going to hear all about it on this week's show. Coming to you from nowhere near the entertainment capital of the world, this is Fan Counters. With Nick and Elizabeth on the Podfix Network. There was this mob of people, and they're screaming my name. Crazy fans. Stop following me. Don't come around my house. If you do, the cops are going to be at yours. If I'm having dinner with my wife, don't sit down at my table. Don't follow me into the bathroom. I continually will get stopped. Can I take a picture? We're gonna. Oh, my God. I think this guy wants to fight me. Ended up being a fan. I'm the only one that's ever been on Sam Jackson and lived to tell about it. <laughs> that's why we call it Fan Counters. I don't think you're going to last on the air very long. <laughs> Malia Beth, welcome to Fan Counters. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. Thank you. You bet. Now, you just wrapped up a one-woman show called The Woman is Perfected. Now, live theater is yes. a lot different than filming for television and movies. So before you tell us about the play, can you talk to us a little bit about how you became involved in the project, maybe how you found out about it? Of course, yes. So um, I was having a little bit of some downtime, and first I went and did some traveling, and then once I had done some traveling, I was, you know, kind of sitting around waiting for auditions. And I realized that that's not the most productive way to go about you know, bringing my career, keeping it going forward. Because with this business, there's times where you're super busy and then when you're really slow. And so I just kind of had this feeling to go look on Backstage West. Okay. And which I've never really done. And I did. And I saw this play and I read the synopsis and about the character and it immediately I started to have kind of a panic feeling. <laughs> <laughs> That's never good when you're thinking about going out for a project. Yes. And I was terrified. And I'm realizing this year that anything that I'm really terrified or scared of doing, I should probably do it because those end up being the most rewarding and fulfilling things that I've ever done. And I realized, hey, I am capable of A, B, and C, the thing that I was most terrified of. Um, 
because I mean, standing up in front of people for 50 minutes with no cuts ever is crazy sounding when you just say it like that to someone that's only done TV and film primarily. Right. Um, but yeah, that's how I got into it. I, I just auditioned. It was a three page audition, just monologue. And somehow I had it memorized in two days. It was just kind of crazy. Um, and I did the audition and I walked out and I felt like it, no matter what, I just really loved the experience of getting to do that, like a real meaty character. And then they asked me to do it and I was painting at the time and I almost dropped my brush. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I was just like, what? Me? Are you sure? Are you positive? You called the right person? Yeah. So tell me what the play's about. Well, the play is about um, this woman named Cassie, and she's there's also a few other characters that I play, which is fun. Um, but she's talking to her mother about the unrealistic goals and uh, ideas that society has placed on women as far as what they deem we need to look like beauty-wise. Because, you know, after 30, if you have one wrinkle, oh, no. You know, your life is ruined. Mm. Um, so she's just had um, a procedure done, and she's talking to her mom that she didn't know it was going to show up that day. And she kind of, we follow her through a psychological breakdown of her disapproving mother and her life and how she got to that point. Um, so it really is a, uh, an amazing play written by Ruth Fowler. Um, she's an amazing writer and feminist and everyone should follow her on Twitter. <laughs> did she incredible. direct, did she direct the play as well? She did not direct the play. Um, the play was directed by Ryan McRee. Um, and he is a amazing, talented director. He, um, got his bachelor's in theater over at USC. So he's a new director, but his talent was quite extraordinary and it was a very wonderful, experience working with him is very collaborative awesome that's always a good thing when you have some feedback yes. in the role and how things should go mm -hmm. yes yes it, it really was an amazing experience every single rehearsal working with him to find who she was and the different things that we should do on stage to keep the attention of everyone for 50 minutes you know yeah, I read a lot about the play. I haven't seen it, obviously, but it talks a lot about perfection, which is something we all strive yes. for. Uh, but it seems like it's a struggle, especially difficult for women, basically due to the amount of like Photoshop pictures of celebrities out there uh, posing as if it's their natural look. Like, yeah, right. Um, but even the amount of yeah. pressure that they put on that's put on by society to always look your best. So how did Cassie resolve those pressures with herself? And is this a subject that you can relate to? Well, Cassie has a hard time. Uh, I wouldn't say that she resolves the issue. Um, I would say that she comes to, I mean, I don't want to ruin the end uh, of the play. Everyone should just come see it. We have four more performances. Um, but she definitely comes to her own okayness, if that makes sense, okay. um, with how she can continue life um, with this obsession that she has almost and I really do believe and know that all women can identify with this um, we did have one audience member who said that she now understands why some women get plastic surgery and that she no longer looks down on them she has a new understanding for why maybe they've done those things and, and to me, that's, that's a big win. I personally have never uh, done anything like that. But I've gone to the dermatologist just for a skin checkup and had them say, oh, you know, maybe you should do some Botox on these lines around your smile, you know, the smile lines. Mm -hmm. um, it's just preventative. And saying no to that pressure and then maybe the dermatologist even saying, oh, no, my wife's the actress. Like, it's not a big deal. Um it is hard, especially in L.A., with that feeling that you have to look like a photoshopped, picture-perfect image of perfection when that's not attainable. And if we all look the same, that's not very interesting and no one is unique anymore. And that's not what beauty is, to me anyway. 
So. Very, very true. And when you talk about beauty, one of the things I read that you have spoken about is the fact that, you know, like I have two twin girl daughters. And so I mm-hmm. had only had a brother growing up. I didn't have, you know, any sisters or anything. So I didn't really have that perspective of how, what it's like to raise a girl. And my dad's first thing every time he sees the twins is, oh, you're so pretty or you look so good today. Uh. And it's like in, in, in everything I've read has told me you have to stop that because they're more than beautiful. They're smart. You know, they're, they're powerful. They have independent thoughts. And it's like, let's talk about some of those things. Like, wow, that artwork is really great that you did. And, uh, you know, he gets upset mm-hmm. with me, but I think that's a generational thing, uh, for me yeah. calling that out. But what advice would you have for parents of girls to raise them to be strong women? I think that it's really easy to fall into what you just said. I mean, I'm a god mom, and I have, I am, uh, aunt to, I mean, one, two, three, five, six, seven <laughs> daughters. You know, not they're not my daughters; they're my siblings' daughters. But uh, they're all girls, and it's very, very easy to just go in the narrative and say, "Oh, she's so pretty. She's so cute. Oh my goodness, those eyes." And exactly what you said, it makes you feel like your value as a little girl, you really do, because it happened to me, you really feel like the only thing I have to give people is if I'm cute and pretty and I say the right things and I smile at the right time and I make society feel comfortable with who I am. And that is not wrong to you know, say that someone looks pretty. Um, But we should be saying that then when we see a little boy, you know, oh, you're Mm -hmm. so beautiful. You're so handsome. If we're going to say those things, it needs to be equal. But seeing yourself as something more is what is the most powerful. So saying to a little girl, oh, my goodness, what are you doing in school? Oh, my goodness, you love science. Wow, you're going to be a little scientist. Really blossoming with the things that they like doing and sparking their interests. I mean, when I was little, if people asked me who my favorite actor was, actress was, I would say Harrison Ford. I didn't (laughs) know that I couldn't be Harrison Ford. I didn't know that because he was a guy, um, that that mean I couldn't be him. I was very confused by that. Um, So making sure that we have representatives out there in every field that are women First of all, it's going to help. Mm-hmm. But second of all, just correcting like you, you've you been doing. And even though the other generations don't understand, um, it's important to keep correcting people and keep the narrative going that we aren't just about our beauty because beauty goes away. And so that's not very sustainable for someone's happiness to be placed just on that. Very true. And I think that that's the kind of thing that needs to be repeated because people really have to over and <laughs> get over. that in their minds. Yeah. Yeah. So in preparation for this one person show, had you watched other one person shows to kind of see how it was done and, and how other actors and actresses took that role on? Yes. Yes. Um, I'm going to say the title wrong. <laughs> um, maybe, maybe it's not wrong. 700 Sundays. Um, can't think of his name right now. This is not good. That's okay. I, I watched quite a few, mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, most of them uh, that I watched were about the person that's talking real life, um, or maybe it was a comedy special type thing about their own life with a projector type of thing on a stage. Um, so I really tried to watch how they used a stage to recreate stories that they were telling um, with just the things that they had on the stage. That I really took away from watching it. Um, But it was definitely different from anything I had seen from the point of view that, you know, I didn't write this. Mm -hmm. Um, It's not about my life. Uh, It's not really a comedy. There's definitely its its own humor. So I, even though I watched a bunch of different things, I still felt, um, scared. Like how, how, how am I going to do this? Um, but it all completely came together in this new thing that I've never done in my life. And now I'm just so ready to keep doing more things that are scary. (laughs) (laughs) That are scary. That's fun. Yes. Yes. 
Walk us through opening night. Like, what time did you arrive for the show? Did you do any pre-show warm-ups? What was the before oh, yeah. time all about for you? Okay, so the show was at 9 p.m., and we need to get there at 8 p.m. And Fringe is different than a normal play. We aren't in the space already for an entire week prior doing tech rehearsal. Um, you know, our stuff doesn't live in the space. So with Fringe, you have 15 minutes to bring all of your stuff, your set, everything you have, set it up. They let people in. You do the performance. They tell everyone after five minutes, we need you to leave because we have to strike everything. We pack everything back up, and then we go outside. So it feels kind of like a traveling show in that sense. Wow, Um, yeah. Yeah. And so um, around 4 p.m., I ran the show in my house for my husband just because Cassie, the character, doesn't think in linear forms and she's not very cohesive with her thoughts. She'll jump from one point to another point that she thinks is more important to tell us about before she goes back to the the previous point that she was telling us about. So she talks a little bit like me, I guess. But when you try to memorize that... It can be very difficult. So I ran through it and basically was jumping up and down because I didn't um, have one moment where I wasn't remembering the next moment since she is so sporadic in her thought process. And then I did some meditation, got all of my things together that I needed, and we drove down there and actually got there at 730 um, so that I could sit in the car for a little bit. And then everybody that's working on the project is very wonderful and outgoing. And I had texted them prior and said, I'm going to be in the zone with my headphones on, listening to music. So if you need anything from me, you know, let me know and then we can talk. But I need to stay in the zone. And everyone was so good about giving me that space. And that really, really helped me to stay where I need to stay and staying really focused before moving on. And my husband came up with that idea. He was like, Olympic athletes do it. Mm-hmm. Come on, you should do it. <laughs> and it really it has been a game changer for me. I mean, music can give you any emotion that you want. And so we went in, set up all of our props and everything that we had. And I went in the back and could hear everyone piling in. And then I just took a few breaths as soon as the lights went out, took out my headphones and just went on and magic happened. I mean, it just came to life. Everything. Now Very with, incredible. Oh, I was going to say with stories going back and forth like that, did you ever get stuck on stage where you're like, oh, not um, on stage for the opening at all, even though, um, you know, different things can happen. Like someone could cough or AC could go on and off. But I I was just so in the moment. It, everything else just disappears. And it was just me with these other people that were in my head that Cassie had created and was recreating. It, it really was wonderful. I mean, the Two days before that, though, on our dress rehearsal, I did. <laughs> okay, well, that's a different story, though. I had so. a full-on moment of, I mean, we had six other people just watching for different technical reasons, and I just was standing there like, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm lost, guys. And that was that was a scary moment, and my director gave me the line, and then I was fine, and so the next you know, day and a half after that, I really had to figure out emotionally why at that one moment, my whole head just went blank. There was nothing else. And that, that is the most terrifying thing I think for any actor on a stage is that you're just going to go blank. There's nothing there, but working through the emotional reasons of why that happened and connecting the one thought, however, I can to the next thought, even though those thoughts do not go together in any way, shape or form. Um, But finding a way to connect them in Cassie's mind instead of trying to connect them in my mind Mm -hmm. really helped me overcome that one moment where I was just going blank. 
Wow. That, I mean, be, scary. <laughs> being in a one person show like that has got to be, I would think, a resume booster because I, I don't know how many people would really take that on. Yeah, that's uh, people keep saying that to me. <laughs> Like, I can't believe you're doing this. I, I wouldn't do it. Someone said it right before my performance. And I was like, that's okay. I was like, uh, don't scare me like that. Yeah. It, it, I hope it's a, a resume booster. I mean, no matter what, though, I am a far better actor than I was at the start of this 50-some-odd days ago. I mean, it, it, this has been a huge thing for my development as an actor. So regardless of how anyone uh, sees it on the resume, which I hope is only positive things. Mm -hmm. it, it's been amazing for me. Just the fact that I was so terrified of just it being me, only me on the stage. There's no one else there to help me. Nothing. Right. Now the best part about plays is the takeaway for the audience. Um, you know, they can be very emotional and all of that. So do you know what the early feedback has been from audiences who have seen the production? Uh, what, what have they been taking away from it? On the website for Hollywood Fringe, there are uh, some reviews that have been coming in. I haven't been looking at them because I really want to stay Definitely. in the atmosphere that I've created. And I don't want anything to influence that because I feel like we really do have something special and something really important to say. And I don't want to affect that. Um, but I've heard <laughs> that it's been very good uh feedback um i've seen people when i after i bowed and stuff were crying um and then hearing that one audience audience member say that um she now understands why people may do the things that they do to their bodies and to themselves mm. definitely was wonderful to hear well congratulations on that role that's really really amazing thank you so i want to talk a little bit about you and your career and your start if you don't mind um, I'm very sure. intrigued by some of your projects, and uh, I've got a, a list of other questions I can't not wait to ask you. So, All right, so at 12 years old, you convinced your family to move to L.A. so you could pursue acting, and I really would have loved the same thing when I was 12. How did you convince them to leave Paradise and help you pursue your dream? <laughs> well, um, my dad moved a lot for his work, and it always was we're going to move either to this place or this place. And when I heard that one of the options was L.A., I just couldn't stop talking about it. Mm. I didn't know how, how I was going to get into the business. I thought you could just show up and knock on someone's door and, you know, they would say, great, yes, you are, you should be doing this. Come with us. Come this way. Um, you know how you do as a kid. You just think things are that way. Yeah. Um, I mean, I saw Hook in the theater when I was a little girl, and I just couldn't stop talking about how I knew that that's what I needed to do. I needed to do that. I needed to be up there amongst that magic. And they, thankfully, were very, very wonderful parents. I mean, if as far as anything that we wanted to pursue, um, you know, if I said I wanted to try uh, synchronized swimming, then the next summer they would let me try synchronized swimming. So, but this was one thing that they were both a little bit hesitant on just because of obvious reasons, worry about the very things that the play talks about, or, you know, the pressures of needing to be perfect in Hollywood. But luckily, through my consistent saying, no, let's move here, let's move over here, they allowed it to happen and then they helped me find my way in that project that I want to do. So that's very awesome. lucky. Now, when you first got to Hollywood, it looked like you booked a few things right off the bat. There was a TV series beyond belief. Um, mm -hmm. then you had a little stint on Amanda Bynes variety show. And mm -hmm. then you did the 13th year, which featured Dave Coulier of full house. But also I read Kristen Stewart was in that in an uncredited role. Yeah. So what do you yeah. take away from those early roles that you had? Well, I felt like I had made it. Do you know what yeah. I mean? I, I mean, I really, I was like, I'm here. I have arrived. I am actually on set. And I mean, it, the, everybody is running around like a beehive and making this incredible, magical thing to me that I wanted to be a part of. And 
I, I just loved it. I loved the waiting around in trailers, waiting for when they were ready. I loved sitting there with everyone setting up lighting. I loved watching it. I, I think that my takeaway was just a reinforcement of, yes, this is your home. This is where you're supposed to be. Wow, that's cool. I mean, because that would be the worst part for some people is, oh, when are we going to get started? But to yeah, take, to take that all in why. is uh, yeah. pretty advanced thinking, I would think, as far as like, how are they doing this? And you're, just your general curiosity. Mm-hmm. So yes. I really want to hear about your experience on the NBC show Parks and Recreation, because that was a show that I never missed. So what can you tell me about your experience working on that show with that amazing cast? Well, picture yourself watching the show and then just kind of jump through the TV. Yeah, I can't That's do that. Really, <laughs> That would be way too amazing. <laughs> it really was like that, though. It just was all of a sudden everything was in 3D. I mean, that set, it didn't feel like a day of work ever. I mean, it was so much fun and everyone was so wonderful and so nice. And everyone that directed was wonderful and the sets were great. I, I it just was an all around wonderful experience. It's the experience that you hope to have on every set, you know. Are there any behind the scene moments that happen to you that stick out in your mind as something you'll never forget? Myself and Jim O'Hare meeting fans, um, because the house that we were in for one of the scenes um for the Christmas episode was very, very warm and we both were in these Christmas sweaters. <laughs> for some reason no one else seemed to be that hot and uh he and i were both really really hot and uh he was like you're hot and i was like i'm so hot if i didn't i you know i don't complain i'm not a complainer i'm i am very happy to be there yeah type of person i'm just so i feel so lucky and excited to be on any set um but somehow i think he noticed you know that i was hot he's like are you hot i'm like yeah i'm hot and he's like all right let's get a fan over i'm like no 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 don't do that <laughs> no that sounds like uh, i'm gonna he's like no no no, it's fine it's fine and he brought a fan over and he really is a a wonderful kind person who we share a lot of the same philosophies about how you should be on a set so i learned a lot from him i really really enjoyed my time with him but another time you kind of geeked out on set was on mad men it was a show that you never yeah. missed an episode of so when you were never Never. <laughs> when you booked that role, like, do you remember where you were and what you were kind of thinking the first time you walked on set? So when I had an audition for it, I mean, this is me and my husband's all time favorite show. It, I mean, really, it, it was we wouldn't go on a vacation. We wouldn't do anything. <laughs> we had to watch the show. Um, so when I even had an audition for it, that was already an amazing moment that I got an audition for it. Um, so when they cast me, I just was kind of in shock. And when I told him, he was like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. And he started like pacing our living room floor. And um, then they said I had a table read and it was just incredible, incredible. The process that they go through or went through over there with the set and the clothes and the hair and double checking everything and um, just really making sure that everything was perfect. That was incredible watching them work and doing that. Um, I mean, <laughs> when I was on the set, I, my heart was beating out of my chest. <laughs> and I remember a moment when um, John Hamm and I had to actually be quite close. And he said, your heart is beating like a little butterfly. And I was like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> just really excited to be here. <laughs> You're like, this is just the coolest thing ever. Now, did your husband go to set so with cool. you at all? No, 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 no. He's, he's very professional person. He likes to stay away from anything, never wants to mess me up or um, get me off track or okay. do anything like that. Yeah. So in addition to your film and TV roles, you've done a lot of commercials too. True. What has that experience been like compared to shooting television and film? Was Is it a lot different or better, worse? Would you like to do more? I would definitely like to do more. Uh, it's great because you meet a lot of directors that are 
getting their start. A lot of them then move on to TV and film. So you get to make some really great uh, connections. It's a lot of fun. You never know who else is going to be on the set that you're going to work with. You get to make a lot of uh, long lasting friends. I've definitely made a few great friends that way. Um, the experience is faster, I would say, but you're also staying in the same five, six lines over and over, okay. di- giving it different ways. So staying on your toes and staying what I call on, I, I just kind of my term that I use, staying on, mm-hmm. staying alert and alive and focused and doing what is needed of you can feel a little bit more tiring at the end of the day or the next day. You feel like you were at Disneyland all day. I heard the food is better on a commercial set rather than uh, the, the TV sets, though. Um, you know, that's not something I noticed. Oh, I've heard oh, because no, there's I like a lot really... of sponsors and big wigs of companies they're trying to impress. I've heard that the food okay. uh, tends to be better, but yeah. I was just seeing if you yeah. knew that, that to be true. You know, sometimes when I'm on sets, I don't eat as much. <laughs> and then other times, so then I just like eat a lot of snacks on set, you know, throughout the whole day. Um, I, yeah, I'm going to definitely pay attention, though, to that now. <laughs> I'll get back to you. Okay. <laughs> so what kind of products have you uh, been an actress in the, the commercial for? I, I know um, Old Spice was one of them, right? Yep, yep. Um, let's see. We have Crocs. Um, uh Jared's K commercial, you know, for K jeweler. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see, Lexus, Honda. Um, oh my goodness, that's so a good list. Things. Okay, oh, that's all right. Nature's Way, NASCAR. Yeah. Okay, very cool. So now you've got a new movie coming out. It's called The Way You Look Tonight. Uh, can you tell us anything yeah. about it uh, ahead of its release? Well. The director has allowed me to say that it is a classic guy meets girl romantic movie that isn't what it seems. It does have a different spin on it that is relevant to our day and age. And um, the woman that he's with is more than she seems to be. And that was an experience incredible experience i actually am one of the co-leads um for that movie and have made some long-lasting friends from that project as well and i can't wait for everyone to see this movie it really is a game changer now i'm not gonna i'll just spill the beans on what's available publicly because i was just gonna wait to see what you were gonna tell me but so on imdb the way you look tonight is, is described as a man approaching 30 is navigating the online dating world so, if she's got something about her that does make me think, what could it be? But we'll have to watch the movie to find out. So, you've mentioned your husband a few times. Where did you guys meet? Was it online? No, actually, we <laughs> met um, <laughs> We met um, in college. He was doing a play, Laramie Project, and I was in the music department uh, getting my music degree in opera production. And the director from Laramie Project came in and said that he needed about six singers for this one section of the play. And I was like, I'll do it. Definitely. I'll do it. And that's where I met my husband. Um, He asked me if I could uh, put his eyeliner on for him every performance because he said he didn't know how. Mm -hmm. I knew that he knew how. Yeah. But. (laughs) Smooth. Yeah, very smooth. <laughs> Not, yeah, I, I can relate. I met my wife doing a play as well. I was doing sound design, and she was in the play, and mm-hmm. romance struck. So there you go. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. Now, you and I also have something in common. You probably don't know this yet, but we've both played the most amazing storytelling game, The Last of Us. Um, ah, hey. And I bring that oh my up. Goodness. Because you're interested in doing maybe some motion capture for gaming, which is oh, completely awesome. What that what about that interests so cool. you so much? Um, so much, <laughs> exactly. so much. I really do feel like uh, games are the future, or at least one of the futures of acting. It already is, but I I don't think that mainstream Hollywood understands like 
how much these games are like movies. I mean, it's gorgeous, right? The last they of us, are. the from the music and the acting and what you can do as an actor. I, I mean, if you just look at um, uh, what's the other movie right now? Planet of the Apes stuff. Mm-hmm. Both movies. Why can't I think of it? Okay. Um, just what you're able to do and become as an actor instead of being yourself, you now are anything. You can be any age, any anything you want to be. And I love the thing that scares me about it, which is you're just in this room, right? Right. That doesn't have anything in it. There's nothing there. Maybe a few uh, hunks of uh, wood that they use to mock, make a door or make a thing that you're going to stand on. And then you're in this jumpsuit with these balls all over you, these little white balls. And you have to actually imagine and be in the space that everyone else sees in the video game that scares me and inspires me. And I love that and want to do that so badly. I really feel like it is the future of acting and I want to be a part of it. I do not want to be left behind. Well, and I think that's true because you think about how many times people are playing these video games. Uh, you know, you think about what audiences. They're like, okay, well, our show has been watched by 3 million people or 4 million people, whatever it is. But how many people have played these games over and over? Like Over and over. Your, your abilities as an actress are on the screen all the time, 24 hours a day, all around the world. Uh, so I think that that would be a really cool thing. And I've always wanted to see that, like filmed and then see the post-production to see how that works. That'd be pretty cool. There's a lot, you can find a lot of stuff on YouTube. I mean, I think it's so cool that I've, <laughs> I've definitely found a bunch of behind the scenes stuff on YouTube and it is so awesome to watch how they film it and how they do it in the process. And I, I have to be a part of that. I have to, Yeah. I have to, I hope you do get to. Me too. Uh, yeah, I did see some planet of the apes stuff uh, when they were doing, the motion capture for those actors and then turning them into gorillas. That was very cool. So, so cool. Check it out. So cool. Now on your Twitter page, I have stalked that as well. And I see, okay. I see that you're a Dodgers fan. Yes. I'm so sorry for that. Because up until ah. their current winning streak, uh, bringing them to 500, your season has not been filled with many things to cheer about. So what is going on in Los Angeles with that baseball team? Um. Well, I see them on Friday. I'm very excited. Nice. Uh, I am a fan. Well, my husband and his dad are real, real, real fans. I mean, they could talk to you about all the ins and outs of baseball in general forever, as long as you want to talk about it. I really, really, really love going to the ballpark. I love seeing when you walk onto the stadium and everything's kind of dark because it was so bright out outside. And then you see the field. It's like this green little heaven in the middle. And it just fills me with like this amazing euphoria feeling, seeing it for the first time. And I feel like I'm constantly trying to catch that feeling again. Um, And I feel like last time the Dodgers won, what was it? 80 something? 97. Oh, yeah, okay. right. something um, like that. Yeah, uh, that you know, everyone's always trying to recatch that feeling, and I think that all Dodger fans right now are still in the mourning process from last year. You're right. Last season. So I think it's maybe a little bit too soon for anyone, and everyone's being a little bit—not um, everyone, but a lot of people—are being a little bit cynical about this season. Um, because they don't want to get their hearts broken. I get that. I'm from. We're, we're in Milwaukee. Yeah. That's where we're taping the show. Um, so we have oh. had nothing but heartbreak for uh, years and years and years and years. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's hard. It really is hard. Yeah, it but is it, hard. It's fun to support a team and just be diehard about it. So. Yes. Yes, I agree, and that's that's where I, my mindset is. So you have said in this interview uh, that this is 2018 is your year of yes. So besides sitting down with me today, how has saying yes to more things changed your year so far? Busier. Okay. Far busier. Um, 
learning uh, how to say yes, but also if something maybe needs a little bit of tweaking, learning how to uh, negotiate with people, even with friends, um, on still saying yes, but maybe tweaking it a little bit. So I, I've definitely learned that I, I can't, I don't need to say no to something and I don't need to say yes to everything, um, go, you know, for the next year. Um, because there are definitely maybe some things that, not that I wish I wouldn't have done, but uh, I ordinarily wouldn't have done them. And I'm glad that I did. And the next year, I think that I want to continue going with this, but definitely make sure that I am making my voice heard instead of just uh, agreeing to everything to be um, agreeable okay. for the sake of agreeing. That's very fair. I think we all have to work on that a little bit. Like, yeah. Especially really and nice people. I feel like you're a really nice person. And sometimes mm-hmm. nice people get taken advantage of or they know you hear what I'm saying. they're not going to say anything. So, no, I get it. We're on to our favorite segment of the show for me. Uh, I got to ask you about your encounters with your fans. Uh, it's the name of our show. So do you have some fan experiences that you will never forget? I have a fan experience. I have a few, but I have one that really sticks out to me. And if this person is listening, I want to say thank you. And what happened is I had a... a uh, so when you audition for... for movies or TV shows, TV shows in particular, they have you do what's called a chemistry read. So after you've auditioned, you come back for a callback, then you go back for a producer's or director's callback. Then sometimes they'll have you come back and pair you up with whoever else would do scenes, the most scenes with you to see if you have good chemistry, and, you know, see if you like each other, basically see how you read together. And I had just done one And I was uh, asked to leave, and another girl that was up for the same part had stayed and was still auditioning. Okay. So I I felt a little uh, bummed, you know, like you always do. You feel a little like, oh, bummer. All right. Well, let's move on. Mm -hmm. But I was in the elevator just uh, feeling that way, you know, letting myself get a little bit into cropping up of feeling some self-doubt. Sure. And... In like we all do at certain times, we all it all it happens, and I was allowing myself this moment. <laughs> you know, I was really living that moment, and there was this woman in the elevator with me, and she turned and she said, "Gergich," I said, "Huh?" <laughs> and I was almost in tears. You know, I was like, "Huh?" And she was like, "Gergich, you're a Gergich sister. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness!" And she wanted to take a selfie with me, and. I got out of that elevator and her and I were talking a little bit more and she was asking me questions and then we went our separate ways and I know she enjoyed her experience and I really enjoyed my experience because it really made me go, no, keep going. Don't quit. Do not ever give up. Even though I was never thinking of giving up, it just really reinforced this feeling of like, no, keep doing what you love doing. Don't let one thing get you down. Keep going. So to that fan, whoever you are, uh, wherever you are, if you hear this, thank you. I really needed that that day. Thank you. That is so awesome. I mean, right place, right time. And like, I, yeah. I'm a firm believer in things are meant to be. In that moment, that person was put by you for that reason. So that's cool. I agree. I really agree. So any weird gifts that fans might have given you or any uh, like weird encounters that left you going, hmm. Um, no, nothing weird yet. I'll definitely let <laughs> you know as soon as that happens. <laughs> okay, that's fair enough. Um, so we've talked about your passion for acting. Uh, I want to talk about your passion for jewelry. You've got a store on Etsy, and you can find it if you search Malia Beth Jewelry. It came up real easy for me. I saw some of your stuff. Um, it seems like you collect things for jewelry wherever you go. Was this yeah. a lifelong hobby for you? My mother, who passed away in 2013, really loves jewelry, and so does my grandmother. And 
you know, anytime that the three of us were together, it was just, oh, what do you have on? What do you have on looking at each other's jewelry? So it's a love that I, I got from her. And then my father, he really loves gemstones and rocks and minerals. Um, he actually works at the uh, Arizona Natural History Museum, Museum in Arizona. And um, so I got my love of things that are nature made, you know, uh, naturally made, uh, from him. And it, it just really spiraled from that of going to places and collecting, uh, gemstones and then having all of these pieces and going, what do I, I should, I'm going to make my own jewelry from this. Yeah. Um, and that sounds just really, you know, amateur, but it, it really was amazing to go and find tourmaline at a mine and then make your own jewelry from it and from there it just my interest kept going and going so then I started working with silver and melting silver and learning how to separate the metals and it, it was just so much that that can be done and it got to a point where anything I wanted I was making and people were wanting it so I just all right let's I'm just gonna since I can't stop making it, I'll sell it. What are the best-selling and, pieces for you? Are they rings or necklaces? So I make these wish bracelets and anklets, and um, those are my best seller. They're on a, a waxed hemp cord, and um, you know they fall off with time. But I would say that my most popular, even though I enjoy making um, metal rings and things of that nature— my most popular would be these necklaces, which I call my healing necklaces. And what they are is I take gemstones and um, different types of beads from different places around the world that I've been. And I put them all together in a way that is artistically unique to the person that is commissioning the piece. So it's very much a, a work of art. And the very first one that I made I showed it to my husband and he said, let me see that. And he put it on, he looked in the mirror and then walked away. Like, hey, <laughs> He's that's, keeping that one. That's mine. Yeah. And he goes, no, 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 this is mine now. And he has worn it every single day since. <laughs> and that was my first indication that, hmm, maybe I should uh, keep doing this. And every single one that I've made, it starts out on my neck and ends up on someone else's neck. <laughs> wow. So are you individually packing these things yourself? If someone places an order, you're handling it, or do you have people for that? I'm handling it. I even write a little note. Oh, yep. that's awesome. Who knows how long I'll be able to keep doing that. Um, you know, I may need to hire someone at some point. But currently and for the foreseeable future, that's, it's all me. Very cool. All right, so check her out on Etsy, Malia Beth Jewelry. Uh, just a few fun questions before we end for today. Um, have you ever been starstruck? Yes. <laughs> Do tell. Are you kidding? Um, let's see. Christy Brinkley, for me, really had me starstruck. But I do believe that even if I didn't know who she was, when you see this woman walk in a room, I mean, everything is just lit up by her light. She is such a kind, sparkly person she loves life and loves people and loves to share her joy. I've never seen someone so humble and so radiant than when I met her. She's the, so kind and wonderful. And I just was in the makeup trailer just staring at her, just staring at Aww. her, staring. I was staring at a human being. And what were you doing where you were on the same show or project? Yeah, yeah, that was it was when we were on the same project and she was oh, which one, playing though? my mom. Sorry, uh Parks and Rec. Oh, okay, all right. I guess I didn't realize she was on Parks and Rec. So I was trying to place where that would have been. Mhm. Mm okay. Yep. So you've mentioned travel a bunch. So what's your what's the coolest place that you visited? Well, I would say if anyone hasn't been to Alaska and seen the glaciers or just been to Alaska, you should go. 
you should definitely go. And then Thailand. Now that is a place full of abundance of fruit and happiness and beauty. That is a magical, magical place. And I can't wait to go back there. I need to go back there. It just is really a place of its own. Hmm. I have never been, but I've heard people who have loved Thailand. Now, do you drive when you're there or are you just walking and taking public taxis and stuff? Well, in Thailand, um, we, my husband and I, we uh, hotel hop. Um, it's for his work. Uh, okay. And he, he works for um, a travel company that uh, caters to people that are sober. So it's, it's called Sober Vacation. And what they do is they take over an entire resort and they kick out all of the alcohol and bring in uh, all of the meetings. So I'm lucky enough to be married to my husband um, and I get to go on trips when he's <laughs> out and looking for new locations um, for his dad. And so we'll stay in a hotel for two nights and then go to a different hotel. And um, we don't drive in somewhere like Thailand. Now, when we went to um, Hawaii, when we were on Maui, we drove, um, because there's so many amazing places to go, um, on Maui if you have a car. Um, but not everywhere do you need to be driving. I mean, and it's also, there's something that's great about just getting in a car or an Uber and being taken to your next destination and being able to look at everything that's around and also ask that person questions about, their culture, about the area. Um, so we try to do that as much as possible, or even taking a train. Trains are really an awesome experience when you're in another country as well. Are there any can't-miss TV shows besides Mad Men that you enjoy watching? Mm, the one I'm watching right now is called um, Happy Valley. It's a it's on BBC, but you can I think you can find it on Netflix. Okay. Um, and I am so addicted to it right now. Nice. Like really, really addicted. Can't stop watching it. What about Stranger um, Things? Have you taken that in? Oh, oh, love. Love it. Love Stranger Things. Oh, my goodness. Anything that puts you in another world, right? It's Definitely. It's so wonderful. Yep. And and even going back in time to that time period is like, because yeah. I, was, I was a kid in the 80s, so it was like everything that, like all the old products that are in Stranger Things, the, from Tab to, you know, all the old mm. designs, I'm just like, oh, I remember that. It, that's why I love watching yes. it. Very yes. cool. Um, so the world is ending. What is your last meal? Oh, that's so sad, the world's ending. That's well, okay. I mean, taking, it out, <laughs> taking that away. Okay, okay. Um, okay, there was a pizza that I had in France, in San Rome, um, that was the best pizza I've ever had in my life. Uh, it had artichokes and this amazing olive oil and garlic and tomatoes and eggplant. And I think about that pizza every time I have a pizza because no pizza ever measures up to it. So, so that's it. That would be my meal. So what else is coming up for you this year? Do you have anything else uh, after this play? you probably take some time off, I would assume. Yes, I want to take a little bit of time off. Um, I think my husband needs to look at a few locations, and he's also a writer, so he wants to take some time writing. He's been really helping me with this project. So uh, maybe take a teensy bit of time off, but other than that, I actually feel very energized to find more magic, more things that scare me. So we'll see what the future holds, considering it is my yes year. So There you go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And where can we find you on social media? At Malia Beth on all platforms. Excellent. Except for Snapchat. You're not on Snapchat? No, I'm not. I'm not. That is the one my co-host, and I'm sorry she's not here today, but uh, Elizabeth, she goes, that's the one I don't understand. Why would you send something that disappears after a certain period of time? I can't explain it to her, but that's okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I get the abhor, and I do the Insta stories. I do a lot of Insta stories, so uh, follow me on Instagram. It's just at Malia Beth. Um, but, yeah, Snapchat, I just never downloaded. Never, never did. So. Okay. <laughs> 
Well, she's currently in a theater show that you can see called The Woman is Perfected. She's also in an upcoming film called The Way You Look Tonight. Malia Beth Johnson has been our guest, and I want to thank you so much for taking this hour and spending it with all of us and uh, sharing a little bit about your life. Thank you so much. It's been awesome. Thank you. You bet. My thanks to Malia Beth Johnson for joining us on the show today. We talked about last meals, and I think if I had a last meal, it would be from Chipotle. And I know that probably sounds really stupid. A lot of people are like, I would want a steak or I would want whatever, you know. But no, for me, it's Chipotle. If Chipotle is listening and they want to sponsor this podcast and just in exchange for free burritos, bring it on. Send me an email to hello at fancounters.com because uh, I would take you up on that. Anyway, next week on the show, we've got another great guest for you. So please tell your friends about our show. Follow us on social media. We are all over the place. Instagram and Twitter at Fan Counters Live. You can also find us on Facebook. We've got our biggest selection of fans there. Over 31,000 fans on Facebook by searching Fan Counters. It's been a great week. We hope you are back next week for another great show. <laughs>